Hello everyone and welcome back to Cobian History. In today's video of medieval professions we will go over the medieval barbers and more specifically over the profession known as the barber surgeon. The barber is quite an old profession as well. Of course since early times most people would want to have their hair cut at some point in their life. And while the profession itself is probably older, the oldest term I could find is from Latin, so that would be during the Roman times, and the word for the profession of barber would be a tonsor. This may also refer to a barber surgeon, as we will get into later, barber surgeon is a combination of a barber as well as a person who would operate on people. Another medieval term for the barber is the puller or the polar. This comes from the Middle English word polle, which means hair of the head. And in Middle Low German it can also mean hair of the head, as well as the top of a tree or other plants. So that's why this term of polar or polar was used as a barber, but also occasionally refers to a person who cuts branches off a tree. But probably the most common term for a barber in the Middle Ages is the barber surgeon, which was more than a modern day barber. As well as the job of the modern day barber, they also would do the occupations that we nowadays associate with surgeons and dentists. A barber surgeon could perform procedures such as bloodlettings, leeching, cup therapy, amputating limbs or pulling teeth. But they could also bathe you, cut hair, shave or trim facial hair and give enemas. They would also come along with armies in time of war to treat the wounded, but also serve the everyday person in peacetime. So I also mentioned the barber surgeons were the medieval dentists, but what does that entail? Because they couldn't give fillings back then. But they did find some other remedies to help toothache. People in the Middle Ages thought that toothworms lived in our teeth. And if you left food on your teeth overnight, the toothworm would come out of your teeth and eat that food. After which it would burrow itself back inside of your tooth before you wake up. And that would cause the toothache. And in the morning, when you'd ask someone to look at your sore tooth, they'd find a cavity where the alleged toothworm would have borrowed itself back in your tooth. To treat the toothache, the barber surgeon would have to kill the toothworm. And they did this using a small hollow metal tube and a long needle. He would hold the tube over the cavity and the needle would have been heated on a fire after which it was inserted into the tube which would lead the needle into the cavity and thus killing the toothworm. Of course we now know there are no such thing as toothworms living in our teeth. But this treatment did actually work because it would kill the nerve cells and thus the tooth would not hurt anymore. This would not stop the rotting of the teeth however and the patient would most likely have to come back to the barber surgeon sometime after to get the teeth pulled out. Another unusual treatment that the barber surgeon would do was to treat a chronic headache. This procedure that the surgeon would perform to treat it is known as trepanning, or in other words, making a burr hole into the skull. And I should also mention that the procedure of making a hole in your head to treat headaches is a pretty old concept that we can trace back all the way to the Stone Age. And trepanning is still done today, although I would imagine it wouldn't just be for a regular headache. To do this, the medieval barber surgeon had a specialized drill to make a hole, or in earlier times it was kind of an arrow shaped object that they would move around to create the hole. Or alternatively, they could also cut a hashtag shape into the skull and take out the middle part to create a square hole. After the hole was created, all the barber surgeon would then do is look at the brain and that was basically it. They wouldn't normally operate on the brain itself, they just wanted to see it to check if it was looking healthy. And a lot can go wrong with drilling a hole in your skull. If it goes too deep, it can damage the brain and if you survived the procedure, the wound could still easily get infected and thus also killing you. 
Despite these dangers, you might be surprised that around 40% of the patients actually survived this procedure and went on to live for a decent amount of time, which to be honest is more than I would have expected. We know this by studying the skulls of these people and we can see some where the hole has rough and jagged edges. These people died during or shortly after the operation, but in others we see healing of the bone, giving it a smooth edge and for this to occur the person would have to have lived for quite a while after the operation. And craziest of all is that skulls have been found of people that had survived multiple burr holes acquired throughout their lifetime. Due to religious and sanitary monastic regulations, monks had to maintain their tonsure, which is a fancy word for the baldness on the top of the head of Catholic monks. And as a little side note, this word tonsure also has its origin in the Latin tonsor, which we mentioned earlier. So to maintain these standards, monasteries regularly trained or hired barber surgeons who would be able to shave them, perform bloodlettings, pull out bad teeth or create ointments. The first barber surgeons to be recognized as such worked in monasteries around the year 1000. During the Middle Ages, physicians considered themselves to be above surgery. They mostly observed surgical patients and offered the patients advice as to what ailed them and what could be done about it. Physicians also often chose to work in universities or to reside in castles where they were treated with wealth for their services. And because physicians would rarely perform surgery themselves, these times saw an increase in barbers, which back then were seen as being medical paraprofessionals. In Italy, barbers were not as common. Medical schools such as the ones in Salerno, Bologna and Padua also trained the physicians to be actual competent surgeons. In Florence, however, physicians and surgeons were actually separated as well. But in 1349, barbers were given an inferior legal status compared to professional surgeons. Formal recognition of their skills in England goes back to the year 1540, when the fellowship of surgeons, who were trained by apprenticeship in contrast to the doctors and physicians who would be trained academically, merged with the company of barbers to form the company of barber surgeons. However, the trade was gradually put under pressure as medical knowledge improved as by the mid-1500s, barbers in England were banned from performing surgical procedures. However, they could still do things like pulling teeth. But the barbers and the surgeons would stay part of the same guild until 1745, when the surgeons split from the barbers' company, which by the way still exists, and the surgeons formed the company of surgeons. As you might have noticed, the professions of barber and surgeon nowadays have come a long way since the medieval barber-surgeon. However, a few traces of this medieval profession can still be observed today. Like the traditional red and white barber's pole, which represents the blood and bandages which would be hung on the barber's door. It's worth to mention that in America the barber's pole has a third color, which is blue, it's not exactly sure what this represents, it could be the blue of the veins, which would be cut during bloodletting, or it could be a show of patriotism, giving a nod to the colors of the American flag. Some also say that the pole itself represents the pole which the customers would have had to grasp and squeeze to show the barber where their veins were located. Another example is the use of the title Mr. rather than Doctor when referring to a surgeon. This is in the UK at least, and most of the rest of the world surgeons are referred to as doctors. This dates back to the days when surgeons did not have a university education. But for some reason in the UK this custom is retained, despite the fact that all surgeons nowadays have to gain a medical degree and doctorate. There are quite a lot of other procedures which the barber surgeon would have performed and that I have not covered in detail in this video. 
For example, they would also study the people's urine to diagnose them in a similar way as the piss prophet, which I have made a video about already. And they could also perform bloodlettings using leeches, which I also made a video about. So there will be a link to those two videos on screen right now, if you're interested in more detail about those procedures. On screen as well is the link to my Medieval Professions playlist if you want to see some other professions. Or you can check out my channel to find a wider variety of historical topics.